Hello everybody and welcome to my first Hearthstone video. Today we're going to be talking about this new deck that I posted recently on Hearthbone called the Spellsword Rogue. Uh, I recently posted this as I said and it got a lot more popularity than I had expected it to. Um, it went to the front page of Hearthbone in about uh, a day and a half, uh, a couple thousand views and a good amount of commenting and liking so I, I thought I would post a video explaining uh, the deck a little bit and also talking about sort of the concept and why I included the cards I did and, and how it works. Um, I will also post another video probably tomorrow, uh, essentially with me laddering on the deck a little bit and um, talking about you know how to play it and how to make it the most effective in practice rather than just in theory. So uh, what's the premise of the deck? Well, it's called Spell Sword for a reason. Uh, this deck is quite different from most rogue decks because what I do is use spell power as a primary mechanic. It doesn't have a lot of combos, uh, and it doesn't require a lot of sort of finesse as far as waiting for the right cards and doing intricate stuff. Uh, it's just good, solid cards with a lot of value in them anyway, uh, helped a lot by having spell power. And so, um, and just as a, as a brief premise here, or preface, um, spell power with rogues is incredible. If you look at a card like Shiv, for instance, so deal a damage, draw a card uh, for two mana. This is essentially a novice engineer that you're playing, uh, except that it will actually do one damage instead of simply dying. Um, you, it replaces itself, it does a damage, it's two mana, that's fine. And yet, if you have even one spell power on the board, it becomes two damage and draw a card, which is very effective, very good. Um, the value skyrockets for the same price. A, a better example, though, I think, is actually Fan of Knives. Uh, already it's good. Deal one damage to all enemy minions, draw a card for three mana. If you add one spell power to it, it becomes Consecrate with card draw. Uh, it also becomes more effective, even if you only hit two things with it. It is more efficient than something like Cleave, uh, Forked Lightning, or Multishot, even. Uh, it's cheaper mana cost, it replaces itself, and you do two damage to as many creatures as you can hit. So I mean, it's it's brilliant already, but with spell power, it is uh, absolutely incredible. So very very good card to have. Um, and so uh, those are the two big ones. Headcrack is another one that's excellent. Uh, but essentially, this deck is is just a good solid rogue deck with a lot of good solid value cards already. Um, and then in it is just a bunch of spell power and things to aid it. Um, so let's go through each of the cards. Uh, not, not all of them, I'm going to leave out some of the ones that you just sort of would expect, um, and, and why I included them. So, uh, because some of them certainly merit discussion. So Backstab I don't need to talk about, uh, it's just it's a good card for rogues, they should generally have it. With spell power it becomes even better, uh, but it's a good card to have in basically every rogue deck. Uh, ditto with Eviscerate, it's excellent all around, and when you have spell power, it becomes very, very good. Um, a really, really good turn four play, for instance, to get rid of Ascension Shieldmaster without affecting your board is put down a Blood Mage Thalnos and eviscerate it, and suddenly you don't have a problem. Um, uh, I will talk about Sap. Um, yep, yeah, that's about. So those are the easy ones. Um, why Argent Squire is the one drop? So it is just a really good sticky minion. Uh, it has a Divine Shield, so it's very difficult to remove, and uh, it's just a solid one-drop. It's something that a lot of decks run in their one-drop slot uh, lately, especially Rush decks. They're just very nice early game cards. Um, and it synergizes quite well with some other stuff that I'll talk about in a moment. I picked Sap instead of Assassinate. So why is this? Uh, Assassinate is good. It's a great card. It's hard removal, 5 mana, not too bad. With preparation, it's even better. Fine. Sap is much more versatile than Assassinate. And the reason I say this is because you can use it to make the opponent think very hard about their next turn in a way that Assassinate doesn't. So let's say you're late game, and your opponent puts down Ysera. And so what you do is you sap it instead of assassinating it. You sap it, you have a bunch more mana to do more things, which is always good, but... Um, at a fundamental level, outside of what it is that you do. Next turn, your opponent now has to think, well, gee, do I spend my entire turn dropping another 9-mana creature, Ysera, again? 
or do I play other stuff? And it screws up the te- it screws up their tempo. It screws up their their thought process, right? If you simply assassinate, a lot of people will actually expect that. A lot of people expect big minions to be uh, hard counter very fast. But if you give them the choice whether or not to replay it and waste another turn, I mean that's that's a pretty big deal as far as I'm concerned. Um, the place where sap falls down over something like assassinate is with handlocks. Um, molten giant's not a decision. Molten Giant is easy. If you make them pick back up a Molten Giant, you're essentially delaying 8 damage for one turn. Because if they have any damage on them already, um, your your opponent that is, um, they will probably get them for essentially free. So um, a Mountain Giant might be good to put back to the hand, depending on how many cards they spent that turn, or a Twilight Drake. But um, for Mountain Giants and some of the other big threats for Warlocks, it just does not help very much. But against a lot of the other creatures, um, most of the rest of the meta. Things like Alexstrasza, or Grom, Hellscream, or a lot of the things in a warrior control sap, I find is just superior. Much more versatile. Plus, you don't feel nearly as bad using a two two mana card to remove something like a Sunwalker, or a Senjen even, if um, if it's in your way for lethal or close to lethal. Um, I'm not advocating that you should do that on a regular basis. You should save it for big stuff. Uh, but it you don't feel as bad. It's not as big of a loss. It's not as big of a mistake in my mind. Uh, Shiv, you don't see a lot of in rogue decks these days, but um, with the spell power, as as I talked about, it's just something that you should have. Um, one mana, or sorry, two mana, one damage, draw a card. That's a novice engineer. If you put out, um, if you have one spell power, if you have two spell power, it becomes a frost bolt. If you have two spell power, it's a frost bolt that draws you a card. Uh, which is incredible. So uh, this is something that, um, in my mind, is already of a fine value, but only gets much, much better as you put spell power down. Uh, Blood Mage Thalnos is a legendary, which I get that a lot of people don't necessarily have, um, but it's just sort of the best of two things combined into one. It is a loot hoarder, uh, it, it is the unholy union of a loot hoarder and a, um, and a Cobalt Geomancer. And so, um, those things are both great on their own, and when you put them both into one card, it's excellent. If I was going to replace it, because you don't have Blood Mage Thalnos, I would put in a Cobalt Geomancer, because the way you should play this is for the spell power. Um, don't ever play the minion on its own. It's not a card to be used on its own. You play it when you're going to play something like Fan of Knives. Um, you have five mana, because suddenly uh, it now becomes a five mana Consecrate with a card draw. right? You, uh, you put it down, you get the extra sort of surprise spell power boost, uh, and then if it dies, so be it, and you get a card as a bonus. So, uh, if you're going to replace it, replace it with Cobalt Geomancer. It's the same basic principle. Um, don't replace it with a Loot Hoarder, because as, as good as card draw is, we have plenty of card draw in the deck. We have Shiv, we have Phantom Knives, we have Azure Drakes, um, al- and the Auctioneer already. We don't need any more, uh, and the spell power is more valuable. Uh, Perdition's Blade. I have this over Assassin's Blade. And the reason for it is because, frankly, it just is a better value, especially in the current meta. So, not a lot of people are running oozes these days, uh, but it is coming back more and more and more. Uh, Warrior aggro, warrior control, both of them are very, very popular, and shamans and uh, are coming back with Doomhammer, less so, but um, the Stormforge Axe. And rogues obviously have a lot of stuff there. Um, a lot, they're starting to come back as well. Um, weapons are quite frequent, and ooze is now a good counter. And so the thing is, if your Assassin's Blade, which cost you 5 mana, gets oozed after the first turn, you lose most of its value. You get a really crappy deal, right? Um, if you deadly poisoned it, now you have 6 mana for 5 damage, and that's it. It is theoretically 20 damage over 4 turns, but if it's if 15 of it is taken from you for 2 mana, that's hardly worth it. Perdition's Blade you can play earlier, and you get 4 damage out of it on the first turn. And the rest of its value is 2 damage. So already I think it is an excellent deal to play it, uh, even if you only have to do the 1 damage with it. Um, use it for board clear, use it to finish off minions that are damaged, use it to kill 2 drops for free. Um, you know, it's just a really, really high value card. It's just, you play it like an SI7 agent, use it for board control, um, 
in my mind, is just a lot more valuable. Uh, you'll notice I also don't have Deadly Poison in this deck, because, again, I don't necessarily care very much about weapons with this deck. A lot of rogues do, um, and rightly so, you can do a lot with them, but this deck uses more spells, more creatures, and doesn't focus a lot on the rogue taking, uh, dealing with a lot of the threats herself. Um, the hero power, I find, is fine for that, and the Perdition's Blade makes up for it in value. So, um, Deadly Poison to me is, even though you should have it, I would argue, in most rogue decks, this, I think, is the exception to the rule. Uh, Fan of Knives, as I've talked about before, it's just excellent. And with spell power, it is all the more excellent. The value completely skyrockets. Um, there's not much more to say about this, it's just something that needs to be here if you're running a spell power deck. Headcrack, same deal. Um, for three mana and a combo, you now have a hunter hero power, as well as your own. Um, it's two damage to the enemy hero, repeatedly, and it is essentially a time bomb. Um, if you have it in your hand, and you are maintaining a sort of a neutral control game with your enemy, you will ultimately have an advantage. Uh, with spell power, obviously, it just gets better. Uh, if you have Malagos out, it happens to be a win condition, because suddenly this hits for 7 damage for 3 mana instead of 2. So, um, this is just an excellent card to have. You only want one, because you should you should be playing this with your spare mana for a turn. Don't ever, don't ever use this as a priority. Um, but having 2 in the deck is not good. They will stay in your hand, and accumulate in your hand, and eventually in order to use them both, you'll have to spend 6 mana per turn, which is sacrificing way too much board control, in my opinion. So, um, I would argue just keep one of these. I'm going to do the Scarlet Crusader first here, and then we'll get to the Blood Knight. Um, <clears throat> so, originally these were Harvest Golems, but I switched them out for the Scarlet Crusader. Why did I do that? Um, functionally, they're, there's not a lot of difference between the two. They both have quote-unquote two lives. Um, Harvest Golem is great because it has the, the Death Rattle um, that brings it back. It's still two damage on the board. Um, but the Scarlet Crusader has three damage, and it also is functionally um, uh, two lives, because of the Divine Shield. Now, it is easy to remove a Scarlet Crusader. A Shaman can Earthshock it, it's gone, um, which is a very satisfying thing to do as a Shaman. Um, there are a number of other ways to get rid of it fairly easily. But, it's still three damage, and it, in my opinion, it, uh, in my experience, it tends to stick around longer than just a turn. Uh, like any Divine Shield minion, they're a bit of a pain to deal with. Now, one of the other reasons that helped to motivate that change was the Blood Knight. So, why have I included a Blood Knight in here? The Blood Knight is a meta counter. Okay, um, Today, in basically every meta deck out there that's a rush deck of any kind, you have Argent Squires. They're just such a lovely first turn play that it would be uh, difficult to justify not having them. Uh, and so, Hunter Rush decks even, uh, even though they're beast-oriented, even though they have better choices, I think, a lot of them will run Argent Squires. Um, things like Rogues obviously will do that, things like Paladins will really obviously do that. Um, even Rush Warlocks, all of that sort of stuff, they will all tend to have Argent Squires. And so, there is nothing that will ruin a Rush deck's day more than coining out a Blood Knight on turn 2 when they have an Argent Squire on the table. There's nothing that will ruin it even more than that if you also have your Argent Squire out on turn 1. And so, suddenly they're facing a 6-6, six, six, or in a really, really ideal circumstance, a 9-9 nine, nine on turn 2. And that pretty often means you win the game. Uh, it is, so it's anti-meta because what it does is it, it counters their early Squire play, um, any Divine Shield play, and it's just a, a solid card. It's also a 3-3 three, three for 3, so it doesn't lose any value if you have to play it on its own. Um, also, though, you have in your deck Argent Squires that are easy to play whenever. On turn 4, that's a really great way to get out of 6-6. Six, six. Um, Scarlet Crusader as well. Um, they synergize equally well. Um, Scarlet Crusader and Argent Squire are popular cards anyway, so the likelihood that you can steal 3-3 uh, three, three from your opponent is uh, not out of the question. I've certainly done it more than once. So, I have it in there because it very often will result in a strong tempo shift in your favor. And even if it doesn't, it's a 3-3 three, three for 3 and it's got fine value. So, that's uh, that's why that's there. I'm not sure it's enough to justify two of them, but it certainly is, in my mind, enough to justify one. Um, 
SI7 is a rogue card that you should just have in all of your rogue decks, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not going to explain that one. That one's easy. Um, the Ochre Magi, again, it's your sort of bread and butter. It's a 4-4 four, for four, 4 with spell plus, uh, plus spell damage, so uh, it fits beautifully with this deck and any spell power deck, really. Um, good value out of this. Why the Shield Master and no Yeti? Uh, reason is that one damage extra from the Yeti, the 4-5, is not going to help you uh, in basically any circumstance as this deck. Um, you can play early game, you can play late game with this deck, you can play mid game really well, but your strength is in spells, and your strength is in removal, and um, and in, to an extent in delay. And so a shield master is better for board control, I would argue, than a yeti is, and the one extra damage that you get from uh, its attack is just not worth the sacrificing of the taunt. So that's essentially why I have him there. The Violet Teacher is probably the card that I'm most willing to negotiate on in terms of uh, whether or not it stays in in the long run. Uh, with all the hand locks going around these days, I'm thinking quite a bit about turning this into a big game hunter. Um, but for right now, uh, I like the Violet Teacher. Essentially, it is often thought of as way more of a threat than it is. It's a 3-5 for 4, which is a good deal anyway. It's fine, it's the same as the Senjen Shield Master, it has an ability, uh, which is good. And you have a lot of spells to play, and so if you play even one, it has better value. It's functionally a 4-6 for 4, which is great. Um, it is also, as I said, it'll bait out removal like nobody's business. Um, perhaps it's because I'm not playing at Legend rank, I'm playing in and around rank 10, a little bit higher. Um, but people get scared of the Violet Teacher, I think, unduly, and will often do things like hex her, polymorph, uh, use buffs to get rid of her. I've actually seen a Warlock use Power Overwhelming to get rid of her. Um, all of these are excellent things, because it means it's removal that is not going towards something like Malagos. Um, and frankly, it's not that much of a threat. It's not as big of a threat as it's perceived as, I think. Having a bunch of 1-1s on the board is excellent. Um, you can use it for cheap removal, but by the same token, I think that um, this card is good because it scares people more than more than a lot of other things. Uh, Azure Drakes, you just you have them in every rogue deck, and you have them in most decks in general. Uh, spell damage is great for us, and the card draw is also great for us. So uh, that's sort of that. This is not a miracle rogue deck, but the auctioneer is still fine. We have a lot of spells. Card draw is important. It's a 4-4 body. Um, it just makes sense. And just like the Violet Teacher, it will bait out removal like nobody's business, and it's wonderful. Uh, people don't tend to think rogues have big cards in their hands, uh, in their decks. And that's great, because they will usually spend removal on lower level stuff. Um, and they do not expect something like Malagos. So uh, this is a very good play as far as I'm concerned. Good for baiting things, and good to get you card draw. If you get even one card out of it, it's worth it. And finally, the big guy. Um, Malagos is a really strong card for this deck because essentially it turns your early game into your late game. Um, you'll notice that I don't have a lot of big mana cards here. I mean, the highest one is five. There's only three fives. I mean, it's very uh, weighted to being low. You can see the, the biggest weight is on the threes. Um, Malagos turns all of those threes and twos into cards that have value of like six or seven or eight. Um, there is nothing like putting out a fan of knives that is actually a flame strike and a half with a card draw. I mean, doing six damage to everything on the board is is insane for three mana. Um, your head crack down does seven damage. Shiv does seven. Uh, Shiv does six damage. Eviscerate when it's comboed does nine. I mean, it essentially means that if it's on the board for more than a turn, they are dead. Um, this is a win more card, not a win card. And what I mean by that is, you can't drop it on a board where you're losing, because you'll just you'll just lose. However, if you are on neutral ground, um, or even in the lead, this will this will usually drive it home for you. Um, the reason it won't turn the game around is because you basically spend your entire turn on it. Right, a nine drop is very inefficient. The best you're going to get out of it is a nine drop and a backstab for seven, or an argent squire if you're unlucky. Uh, but in essence, you have to make sure that you know it stays on the board for a turn. So it's weak on that level. 
But often, as I've said, uh, people will remove your stuff early. They will remove Gadgets and Auctioneer, they'll remove the Violet Teacher, and they will leave your Malagos alone because they don't know you have it. So I think that um, in general it's, it's quite strong that way. Um, and it also is a big fat minion. If they have to remove it traditionally, then they will have a hard time with it. So uh, it's not my favorite card in the world in terms of efficiency. I, I like the value of basically every card in this deck except Malagos. But by the same token, if he lives for even a turn, you basically win. So uh, I think it is worth it. And it's just sort of a nice flavor. I think it adds, it adds a nice flavor to the deck. So uh, the other thing for the record is that if you don't have Malagos, which I think a lot of people don't, um, don't replace him with a spell power minion per se. Um, the Archmage is not necessarily very good uh, as a replacement. Ancient Mage, certainly not. Things like that. It's, it's not really worth it. His value isn't turning your early game into your late game, because you don't really have a late game. If you don't have him to do that, then you need a late game. So I would put in Ragnaros instead. Um, even Ysera, but I would prefer Ragnaros. Um, and if you don't have any legendaries like that, maybe a Boulder Fist Ogre, or... Um, it's just sort of a big fat thing at the end. Uh, maybe even a giant, but um, uh, something that you don't need to have conditions for would be better. I, I would advocate Rag in his place if you don't have him, but it will absolutely change the nature of the deck, so be aware of that. Um, so that's basically the deck. Um, as far as strategies are concerned, um, I'm going to make a video, as I said at the beginning, uh, laddering with this, so we'll take that up mostly there. But uh, Essentially, you want to, if you're facing an aggro deck, you want to out-control them, and if you're facing a control deck, you want to out-aggro them. Uh, it's very modular that way. You can put big threats on the table very early with things like the Blood Knight. Um, even Argent Squire and, um, and Scarlet Crusader SI7, all those sort of things can get on the board fairly early and cause threat, especially if you have the Perdition's Blade in there too. Um, this deck certainly likes the coin, but so does any deck, so that's fine. Um, but in a control war, I, I find that it's actually quite good against things like control warriors and that sort of stuff, because it does have a lot of ways to fight them early, and it doesn't die right away in the late game, especially because of things like sap and all of that. Um, the one deck this tends to struggle against quite a bit is the handlock, um, but to change it to make it better against the handlock, you know, you, you put a big game hunter in here against the Violet Teacher, um, maybe put in Betrayal, um, something like this, to get the giants to be hitting each other. Uh, you'd probably switch in Assassinate, that sort of thing. Um, it would change it to make it worse against most of its other matchups. I find that this deck does exceptionally well in general, and in that particular matchup it has problems. So, um, right now I have about a 70% win rate with it or so uh, in or around the 10 level, uh, and I like it the way it is. So be aware when you're fighting a handlock, you will struggle. Uh, and again, I think that I may well turn in this into a big game hunter to help a little bit with it. Um, but in basically every other instance, it's quite good, and quite solid, quite value-laden, and not reliant upon combos, which is something that I tend to dislike in a lot of rogue decks. They're very reliant on getting you know, two shadow steps, two cold bloods, and popping a Leroy, something like this. Um, this deck is just nice uh, without that. So, um, thanks so much for watching, um, and if you liked it, subscribe, like for, for some more. Um, I definitely want to put more Hearthstone videos up because it's just a really excellent game and I enjoy it thoroughly. Um, and so I probably will. Um, stay tuned for me laddering with this deck. And if you have any questions, um, I'm going to post the Hearthpone link in the description of the video, so feel free to uh, post comments in that particular uh, deck uh, thread, that, uh, that deck uh, page, and I will uh, do my best to get to them quickly. Okay, so uh, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.